The presenting sponsor of this episode of the Canny Climate Dialogues podcast is the University of Auckland's International Office. As you can imagine, New Zealand is a unique place to think about climate through the lens of their indigenous cultures. Leading the world's universities in the Times Higher Ed Global Impact Rankings for the first two years of the rankings, as we all work towards the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the international team at the University of Auckland share your concerns about climate action and international education. The University of Auckland is answering the world's call. Welcome to the Canny Climate Dialogues, the podcast at the intersection of international education and climate action. Today's episode is hosted by Antonio Guterres, who will be speaking with Fernando Morales, current PhD candidate researching ecosystem restoration at the University of Granada, and coordinator of the project Kabila Initiative. In this episode, Fernando shares his reflections on COP27, which occurred in Egypt in November 2022, and the role of youth movements for climate on advocating for higher education to push for nature-positive change. A quick disclaimer, Antonio and Fernando recorded this episode outside, so the audio quality will sound different than usual. If you want to see their beautiful location and you aren't already watching this episode on YouTube, head over to our YouTube channel to check it out. Today's guest is Fernando Morales. He's a dear colleague and he's here in Granada joining us for this new Climate Dialogues uh, episode. Fernando, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Fernando is a PhD candidate from the University of Granada. He's the coordinator of the Ecological Restoration Project Iniciativa Cabula. He is the new chairman of the Generation Restoration Youth Hub from the World Economic Forum, and he has attended several of United Nations conferences on climate change, mm. COPs. So, Fernando, how are you feeling today? I am feeling very good being with you here. Antonio. So, we ask this to everyone. Please, can you tell us a little bit of what is your climate story? Uh-huh. Okay. Well, um, I would say my, my climate story actually starts very early at my age. I would say when I was walking with my dog, you know, in the, in the, actually in the mountain we have behind us. Um, so I live very close to a mining area and it was a very degraded place. Uh, so from the very beginning, I just imagined how would it be this that place with a forest. Um, when, so with so, I, with the time I started to st study environmental science, so pretty much it provided me with the sustainability lens. Um, also, I made a, a master on, on governance and territorial planning. Um, and basically I started trying to, to do as much as I could to give a hand to, you know, to give away from the path we are taking right now and heal the planet. Yes. Yeah. So let's ride, uh, let's dive right into it. Um, you have been in the last COP in Egypt yeah. and I would like to hear your takeaways, good and bad. Oh, well, well, that's a very difficult question because, you know, um, the United Nations, the climate conference are very, very complex in the way that there are many different things happening at the same time. And that means that we have on one side, the negotiation spaces, which all the decisions are, are being made. Um, I couldn't be inside of this space. And actually it's something we, the youth as, as a movement, we struggle a lot to have some room for just giving our voice, you know, at the end, the youth, we are the one who are gonna be benefited and be dealing with the decisions that are being made today. So on that one, on one side, the negotiations were like, I would say disappointing, I have to say, honestly, because, you know, they, they, there wasn't pretty much progress on tackling the, the emissions globally. Uh, there were very crucial issues as, uh, for example, putting a name on the, which, which, uh, energies are we consuming the most? That means coal, oil, and gas. And, you know, it, the second comp, the second cops that uh, they mentioned, which, which energies are these? But at the end, uh, they don't put any breaks to, to that. And the language is very soft. Um, there were also struggles about maintaining the 1.5 degree of life. That means uh, pretty much to keep our temperature rise under this uh, temperature, um, temperature, um, numbers um and this is important because at the end it, it was keeps our courage and, and ambition alive 
Uh, but at the end, we don't need more words. We need actions. Um, so in terms of the negotiations, some you know some gainings has been the open of the of the fund for loss and damage. That actually was an historical, a very historical um, a, a fight. Actually, it started in the 1992, so it's a long story. And basically, it's that the poor, the developing countries are are asking for you know the, the support to deal with the, the problem that basically the, the developed countries has caused, that is climate change. So for the very first time, we have uh, by now uh, an em empty bucket. It needs to be filled with money. We will see who fills the bucket and how much we're going to be filled with. But it's a very starting point. So as a general response, yeah, I would say disappointed. But I have to keep my, you know, my energies up and all the, the hope. Uh, my hope without hope it relies on the, on, the, on the outside of the negotiation rooms. Because you can see how the networks and the programs and the, you know, relationships uh, proliferate. And that's something that gives me a lot of hope. So what would you say is the role of, of these um, youth um, associations and these youth movements inside of this um, congresses? Well, so we have seen from the last, I would say, like last five, four COPs, uh, very good progress on the presence of the youth movement in the negotiations. Uh, you can feel it in the from the panels. Uh, almost not all the panels, but many of them have a youth representation. Um, also, for the very first time, this COP had uh, the youth, the children and youth pavilion, which is important because at the end it was the space in which for the youth almost everything happened. From you can you could have coffee <laughs> for for free, which you know in these very energetic days is important. Uh, but it overall, was a, a place to to meet together and and mm -hmm. to reconcile ideas and generate new ones. And so, very was a very magical space. And I have to say that it was the most energetic space. There were singers, poetry, uh, many other cultural. Yeah, in contrast with many other pavilions. So that's that's the somehow is the representation of the new fresh air that that we can provide to the to the, these spaces. Um, and at the same time, also the youth is pushing forward to to creating um, so this advocacy in the negotiation spheres. So basically, have a voice and and be represented uh, in the messages that we want to convey to the to the leaders, right? Um, so yeah, there are many incredible groups. I have to mention, for example, Youth for Nature. I, I love them. This is a very it's a very well structured community from people from all around the world that highlights and, and, and elevate the, the voice of, of youth and with a strong focus on nature resolutions. You know, at the end, nature probably will be our best ally in the fight we have ahead in the in the next decade. Definitely. This is why we're all here, right? Yeah. Um, so I want to go from global to local a little bit. Um, we mentioned at the beginning of the pod that you are the coordinator of the Cabula Initiative or Iniciativa Cabula mm -hmm. here in Granada. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we have been participating with you. We know um, this is how we started working together. And I would like you to, to tell our listeners, what is Iniciativa Cabula? What are you doing here in, in Granada? Well, so uh, I would say that the Cabula Initiative, for me, is a, a story in which uh, a local community from the very bottom up has scaled up the idea that we humans can align our efforts with nature and with our collective intelligence, we can do something to help to, to help the planet to heal itself, right? So uh, the project has occurred in a, in a very degraded place, as I mentioned in the beginning, in an old mining area. Um, so at the very beginning, we was, were just a group of friends that joined to plant some trees. But with the time, it like... it. It grew little by little and upscale in different levels of governance. So what at the beginning was a group of friends became a, a, a community group with different networks. Then people from outside of the community started to join. Also the local uh, municipality integrated into the into the program, the political program, which is very important. Oh yeah, you need the support of the uh, politics. Um, 
Then also the university academia brought the science and in some cases the technology. Uh, what else? Different uh, companies also joined. Um, so at the end, we started to we we kickstart a movement uh, that locally is very representative because at the end we are seeing how how we can help biodiversity come back. So it's very easy. You can see there now different animals from from foxes to frogs, uh, also migrating birds that are passing through there to to feed the, the yeah to feed themselves. Um, so it's a, a very inspiring sp story. So Definitely. hopefully something we can scale up or replicate elsewhere. And we have so much fun in, in El Parque de las Yeah, Cal that's also an important part. Yeah, actually, it's a really important um, part. Yeah, I, I, I do believe this. And we'll come back to this during the podcast. Um, I did want to ask you, what other um, success stories do you know out there from other youth movements, from other people that are making an impact and inspiring others in, in their own communities. Mm -hmm. Well, I I mentioned Youth for Nature. Uh, if I can give some more details about that, uh, for me it's really inspired because um, they they have divided their force in the, uh, all around the globe. Uh, and you can feel it because it's really diverse. So you can see perspectives from Africa, South Asia, Latin America, um, which are very different from one to another. Um, so at the, with these representations, you generate uh, integ an, an integrated vision. And that's something we fully need. We we don't need more top-down approaches from the global north to the global south because we have seen that many times and we already know that that's something that doesn't really work if we want to really heal the planet and, and, and do something meaningful. So for me, Youth for Nature, which uh, a very high value it has, it's like they even, they are very young. They are very well organized, uh, so it's a very good representation that we as youth we have some uh, strong strengths and and interesting programs that we can provide with for the developing new pathways to basically be outside of the way that we are taking right now. These yeah, uh, burning fossil fuels again, destroying the ecosystem that sustain us, and many other things that we should change drastically. Uh, yeah, as an yeah. emergence we are right now, right? Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Okay. Um, I want to get into a little more controversial topic. I know that apart from your PhD, you're also teaching some classes in the University of Granada. Uh, you're part of the um, Laboratory for Sustainability that has just been created. I would like to ask you, what is it that we can do both as youth and as educators um, to pressure the leadership in, in higher education, because it does seem to me that universities should be the leading torch in this fight. They should be an inspiring, um, an inspiring uh, motor to to help change and help guide societies into more sustainable uh, practices. So, what can we do to help leadership realize that this needs to change and that this needs to become a priority? <laughs> well, for me. As, as usually, it all starts with the information that's basic, right? It's like uh, we are talking that we are saying that we need to change the pathway. We can keep, uh, you know, uh, the, the pathway we are taking right now. Um, we know uh, if we use the science on the path, the guiding principle, we should be reducing uh, 70 percent, sorry, uh, 7.5 percent per year. Uh, our global emissions, and we are going exactly in the opposite direction, which is where increasing in the next decade, we will increase as as it's been uh, calculated, sixteen uh, percent. So that's these are really bad news. Yes. So how do we do that? How can we change the pathway? So we need to inform ourselves and 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 construct a good narrative that it ha is co is is cohesionate and is solid. To, to basically generate confidence uh, of a, a, a possible alternative. We, can just com we can't just complain and say it's going wrong, but we need to provide some, some examples of success and, and positive futures, right? Um, and then um, in parallel, I would say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know which is more important, but definitely very important from my perspective is to, to join efforts. That's something that definitely we, alone we can do as much as we can do together. Um, 
And, you know, especially in the youth movement, it's something that uh, is very common. I, I, I don't want to talk uh, as the youth in general. I'm talking from myself and from what I have seen. But I see that the youth in general, we, we're lacking from experience, contacts, uh, money, money times. Um, so we saw there's a lack of also of confidence. Uh, something that the community gives to you is exactly that. Right, get feeling part of something bigger and broader. Um, feel like you have a net where you can fall. Exactly, exactly that. So we thought we saw as a basis that's just starting to advocate how how to advocate. Well, there are many different ways and very creative ways. And, and more and more with the time, we are seeing many different ways in which people are achieving amazing changes. Right. Uh, definitely, in the case of youth, uh, the media has a strong potential. I think it's something we can. We have not used at its at a full potential. We just have to see how they, for example, influencers, right? That's something that is blooming all over. But I see few of them that are talking of real facts, real problems we're facing right now as a society. And they have in their hands a strong potential, a strong power, right? which is basically say, we should be doing this instead of that. And a lot of people that are following the, their messages will definitely take that action that they are proposing. It's a great idea about um, putting your hand out to create alliances. And we're talking about influencers, we're talking about artists, I assume, about sports, people in sport, uh, football players. The, that they have millions and millions of followers. Um, it's a good idea. And how do we get to to the universities? How can we... How can we be the ones that, that lead the change, that are contributing to educating um, the new generations and, and, and the generations that are going to be the adults in the next 40 years? Yeah. You know, for me, this is a, it's a polit polemical issue in the way that on the one side, university is the perfect place to, to talk about the problems. It's where the science generally comes from. And I have to clarify that for me, science is not all the knowledge we have without at all. Uh, I, I will even say that we have wider knowledge in the in the local practices and the, and the traditional practices. Is it not on the papers, but in the hands and the minds of many people that they, especially the people that still conserve a good relationship and and, and non-based jobs, right? Um, uh, but we saw um, the universities. We could be we could be right now discussing what 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 new scenarios can we create. With the techniques we have and the and the also the the knowledge, because I I would say that um, it's not about the climate change and the global change in general problem. It's not a problem of technology or knowledge. It's a political problem at the end. So that that's when I enter into the second part, part right? So we should have discussing this at the university. That that's something we can do. But on the other hand. University are on the service of the of the public, of, on the of this of the people, and that's where politics enters in, right? So we as people, we university are a reflect of are, are an effect of of the of the societies we live in in many ways. So people, we should be uh, asking, not asking, but um, advocating also to university to take the direction we feel is important. And uh, right now, as a society in general, we are we are seeing a growing movement of people, and with with so also universities, um, and drawing down a, a investment for com a fossil fuels um, companies and and banks, uh, also leading many universities leading in the energy transition pathways. For example, I can I can say from the Glasgow University, they are they have transformed all the the in the last three years all the energy system, which. It's from the, also there's an alliance for the the this is the Oxford University that uh, has generated the Nature Positive University networks, and uh, that means that they are trying to to all many as a network to all together push towards a more nature positive places, right? Because the campus are enormous in many cases. So so yeah, I would say as a as a conclusion in this that for the question is like yeah yes university can make a huge difference. Um, and yes, we should advocate within and from the outside of university for yeah greater actions. Definitely, definitely. Hey, this is great. Um, Fernando, we're gonna go into an easier way to to end. 
Um, you have been an incredible inspiration for all of us, uh, all the group of friends that are now part of Iniciativa Cabula, of the Parque de las Canteras, people who are moving around. And it has always been uh, really interesting for me, um, your power of inspiring, uh, your power to motivate others to to take a closer look to this uh, hard truths, to take a closer look at how they are they're living, how they're acting, what they're working on. And and uh, not only for me, but I see a lot of the people surrounding us that um, leading by example without being too pushy, you have been able to create a lot of uh, ripple effects in in young, in youngsters and, and the people you've known. I would like to ask you if you have any personal tricks, like what are the ways, how do you motivate others to to just start looking at this and integrating this in a in a soft way, in a in a compassionate way, without so much fighting and and without so much guilt. How how do you inspire those those people to to start looking at uh, natural restoration and, and climate change in a more active way? Uh, mm. um, well, I think you mentioned something really important before that is a, to make it kind of funny right kind of yes we did don't think yeah so the idea that is something that is something fun. yeah something fun it's so and sometimes it's very complex in the way that the, the problem we have in the front of us is at the same time very complex but i think that we as humans we operate in the way that we need the the, the things simple simple uh so in in absolute terms that means that uh for example let me use the structure of pachama pachama is a, a an ngo from latin america and they talk about the four levels of actions we can take. So that means individual action, at home, taking the bike, changing from your bank, and many other things you can do. Uh, secondly is your close circle, your family, your friends, uh, opening the the conversation about what's happening, what should we do, etc. Um, the third level is um, your community. For example, that would be uh, basically in the population in which you, you live. And you can generate associations, uh, join uh, or ongoing projects and things like that. And finally, the full state maybe is the more untangible one, but is the systemic level. That would be, for example, to vote for politicians that you yeah, you shared ideas. Um, also, I don't know, for example, join a, a signature list for changing any politics or serious things of, of, of that kind. Um, and for me, my case, coming back to the questions you made, I don't know. I don't know. I just, <laughs> I think, for me, I, I think, do it naturally. Uh, I think that it's really important is well, while you are trying to educate, is that you can't educate someone if you don't do what you're trying to convey to transmit, right? So for me, uh, all the changes start from the inside, from in yourself. Actually, already Gandhi said that before, right? <laughs> see the change you want to see in the world. And for me, that's something that in the practice takes a lot of strength. Strength. Um, in my case, I try to not to show to the rest, but for me to to you know to be calm and sleep in the night, trying to be as much as more sustainable as I can. Um, and oh, that you just can't be hundred percent sustainable. No, no, it's difficult. But you know, without paying attention to that little by little, just it's like a like a wave, right? And and everything without yeah. I believe everyone feels kind of attracted to the idea because it's, it's somehow it's coherent, right? I think it's coherent the idea that we need to be responsible of our future um, and take actions with that in mind, right? I remember one sentence that you said to me once when I was asking you, how can I become more sustainable? And you simply looked at me and said, you need to make a complicated decision. You need to not go with a comfortable choice. You need to be tough and try hard. And with time, it, it's funny how it, it does come easier. Mm -hmm. And you incorporate one or two practices and then you incorporate two more. And by the time you're incorporating the fifth one, it's, you know, it's more natural. And it happens a lot. Yeah. But I think there's a surprise in that process because on one side, you need to take some sacrifices, definitely, of comfort, probably. But on the other hand, you also, uh, you receive surprisingly very inspi inspiration. Um, and how, how would you say, for example, if you 
if you, let's say the example of the couple initiative, you plant a tree, that's something very positive, and probably you would be uh, taking more, you will be funnier in a party, but you're planting a tree under the sun, right? But in, in so you, you feel that you're, you feel connected to the place in which you are living in it. And that's something very rewarding, right? Very comfortable for you. And that's something that we can stick and, and grab that idea and, and remain stick to that, to that feeling. Um, you got the that thing will you, came. It does make you sleep better at night. Yeah. <laughs> so Fernando, um, I want to thank you so much for doing this with us. Um, and I hope to see you in some other climate dialogue some other time. It would be a pleasure. Thank you, up. Thank you so much. Thanks to you. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Canny Climate Dialogues. Two quick, easy climate actions you can take today are to subscribe to and rate our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Feel free to leave a comment and let us know what you think. We'd also like to remind our listeners that Canny is a volunteer-run and led organization. If you have felt inspired by this episode today, please consider heading to our website, canny.org, and making a donation to help our operations and growth. Thanks again. We'll talk to you next time.